Hello everybody, welcome to Science and Cocktails tonight, kindly organized by Kostas, Kevin, Vishnu, and various student helpers and others. Thank you. Tonight I want to tell you a story about science and humanity with a focus on Africa. But in order to do that, I must first move out of Africa and back a hundred years. Let's see if this works. First, I have to switch it on. Sorry, I'm a theorist. <laughs> Whoops. I'm a theorist with a trigger finger. There we go. No, there we go. 100 years ago, more or less, 1915. Einstein publishes his remarkable theory of general relativity, which, as many of you might know, and if you don't, this is a good moment to realize it, the idea is that gravity actually curves space-time, a completely revolutionary idea, almost inconceivably revolutionary. So weird that you might think it would never succeed, but actually it did. Sorry, technology, okay. One interesting thing to point out before I go on to sing the praises of Einstein is just to point out the major mistake he made two years after he came up with his theory. He tried to apply his theory to the universe, but he had this prejudice, along with many other people, and physicists included. The prejudice was that the universe was unchanging, permanent, out there, always had been. And when he used his new equations to try to describe the scenario, he found it impossible to keep the universe static. It just wanted to move and evolve and be dynamic. And Einstein took a while to come around to the idea that he suffered from a philosophical prejudice and that he was undermining his own physics by assuming that the universe should be unchanging and eternal, when in fact it's a very dynamic object. There were other people like Friedman, the Russian engineer, and others like him in the 20s who, were, who went freely into his equations and showed that they actually predict that the universe should be expanding. And an expanding universe is the opposite of an eternal, unchanging universe. It's evolving, it's, it's changing. And observers like, whoops, wrong button. Observers like Henrietta Leavitt and Edwin Hubble confirmed that the universe was expanding. And in fact, this was a momentous moment in the history of science and the history of humanity's understanding of the world around us, because for the first time, we actually ha had a scientific model of the universe. There were scientific models of everything else that we could think of, but the universe as a whole had no scientific theory until the 20s. So that was a major moment of, of progress for human understanding of our place in the universe. And it lasted for about 70 years until a, a rather uncomfortable and shocking revolution took place. So the idea that the universe is expanding basically means that galaxies move apart from each other. Space actually is getting bigger. And our galaxy is moving away from all other galaxies. And for a long time, it was thought, for 70 years or so, it was thought that because gravities still have this gravitational pull on each other, the rate of expansion should be slowing down. But in the late 1990s, observers discovered that the rate of expansion had been speeding up for the last four or five billion years, not slowing down. So this was a complete shock and surprise. The universe was actually accelerating instead of decelerating. And normal people you know, carried on living, nobody got shocked that the universe was accelerating rather than decelerating, but cosmologists like myself got very upset about this, and then very excited, and then very upset again. <laughs> so, so why, I'll, I'll explain a little bit as to why the excitement and then the, the shock and the upset. 
The simplest answer to explain why the universe was accelerating was actually to resuscitate a constant that Einstein had tried to use to keep his model of the universe static. His constant held apart the galaxies so they didn't fall into each other. So if we resuscitated this constant called lambda, it actually represented the effect of the empty space between galaxies, what we call the vacuum energy, the energy of the vacuum. And this vacuum energy is a strange thing. It's not nothing. It's not just nothingness or emptiness, as you might think from the word vacuum. It actually is a real field, a real force, if you like. So lambda is what was called dark energy, because it's not something that you could see or measure directly. And if we used Einstein's lambda constant and we, we identified it as the energy of the vacuum, then it could mathematically explain the acceleration of the universe. And so we had this very strange universe in which 70% of the energy in the universe had to be in the form of dark energy, pushing the galaxies apart faster and faster. The normal matter that we're made of in our planets and our galaxy and everything we see is made of, made up only 5%. And the remaining 26% or so is made up of dark matter, which I don't have talk, time to talk about, but we could discuss that. The key thing about dark matter is that it builds and stabilizes galaxies while dark energy accelerates the universe. Two very different things. They're both dark, but they do different things. So anyway, I'm going to get to a point. Don't worry, this is, this is going somewhere. And the point I'm going to make should be on the next slide. Well, there are, two, there are many points to make. The first point to make is that I just want to focus on that word, the simple answer, because it turned out that this revolution, which I'm calling the revolution that the universe is actually accelerating, came with a, a crisis, it came with a price. The simple answer of the vacuum energy actually caused a huge amount of bother because the observed value of lambda was incredibly much, much smaller than the best predictions that the theorists could come up for what the vacuum energy value should be in our universe. 10 to the 48 at least, that's one with 48 zeros times smaller, at least. And the fact is that in, according to this model of the universe, lambda had to be very small, otherwise the galaxies would not have formed, and then we wouldn't be around to observe the accelerating universe. And the theorists could only make it extremely large relative to this very small value. So the most famous attempt to resolve this crisis, perhaps, or one of the most publicly famous ones, is called the multiverse, the idea that our universe is just one of many, many universes, and in each universe the lambda value is different, and we just happen to be in one with a small lambda value. And string theory has been used to try to elaborate this idea, but it's, it's an incomplete idea. Uh, here's a string theorist, Jim Gates, who's explaining Maybe. I'm not sure what he's explaining. I can't read the equations. But maybe he's trying to explain the multiverse. So there is this crisis, and it remains unresolved. It's one of the great mysteries of physics. Uh, other people like uh, Kevin and Vishnu could tell you more about it. But what I would s slightly shift to, to change gears as a more kind of pedestrian cosmologist rather than a string theorist, is this... Given this crisis about dark energy, the fact that it's very difficult to explain how it could be so small, some people started asking, well, could there actually be something wrong with Einstein's theory rather than something wrong with predictions about the value of lambda? So the way this works is something like the following. In, in Einstein's theory, the galaxies are being pushed apart by the effect of dark energy so that the universe starts to expand faster and faster. The dark energy starts to overcome the gravitational pull between the galaxies. So instead of the, of the expansion slowing down, it starts to speed up, because the empty space has this kind of an anti-gravity effect. It's not real anti-gravity, but it's sort of like anti-gravity. But people, some people started to suggest, well, maybe, maybe that's not actually happening. Maybe there is no dark energy of the vacuum in, in empty space. Maybe Einstein's theory is not working when it comes to describing what's happening 
between galaxies and the expansion of the universe. Maybe gravity is weaker than Einstein predicted, and that's why the acceleration is speeding, is, is happening. That's why the expansion is speeding up. And there are historical precedents, and in fact one in gravity, and this, this concerns the, the nature of Mercury's orbit, which for many years in the 19th century could not be explained using Newton's theory of gravity. And eventually some physicist whose name I forget came up with the idea that you could explain the behavior of Mercury's orbit if there was a dark planet called Vulcan. But some other physicists subsequently showed that the Vulcan theory, the dark planet theory, didn't work. It actually failed. And in the end, the behavior of Mercury's orbit was a signal that Newton's theory could not correctly describe everything in the solar system. And that's the, one of the key, moment, key conquests of Einstein's theory, was to correctly predict this anomalous behavior of Mercury's orbit. So perhaps we're at a crossroads where Einstein's theory might be reaching its limits. Okay, so how has GR, general relativity, how has it performed with tests up to now? Well, it's performed extremely well, and one of the most familiar ways in which Einstein's theory is verified is through GPS. GPS depends on special relativity and general relativity to be correct and precise. And the general relativity correction is bigger than the special relativity correction. So every time you use GPS on your cell phone, whether you're walking around a city or driving through the bush, you should know that Einstein, Einstein's theory is what is making this thing work. And it would be completely inaccurate within a matter of hours and days if it weren't for Einstein's theory. So that's one familiar, but maybe not so well-known, success of Einstein's theory. In the solar system, by sending radar to the moon and planets, Einstein's theory has been verified to a high degree of accuracy. And then in the Milky Way, further away from the solar system, these binary pulsars, pairs of spinning neutron stars, which are extremely compact, dense, and spinning very quickly, their behavior has been accurately monitored, and Einstein's theory predicts it almost exactly, to the highest degree of accuracy. Unbelievable. In 2015, 100 years after Einstein announced his theory, there was the most dramatic discovery and confirmation of his theory. His prediction that there should be gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space and time, caused by the movement of, the violent movement of objects in the universe, was verified when the LIGO detector discovered gravitational waves, which were then tied down to the, the in-spiraling merge of two huge black holes in a distant galaxy, not too far away, a few hundred million light years away. So Einstein's theory, and this is a most remarkable discovery of probably of this century so far, certainly of this century, and it led to a Nobel Prize. So Einstein's theory has passed tests out to the edges of our galaxy and to nearby galaxies. But we haven't yet been able to test it at the same, at the same rigor on the larger scales where dark energy operates. So this is the issue. And if you're wondering about the radio telescope, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm on the road towards it, don't worry. So how would we test GR on cosmic scales? So we're now we're talking about scales not just of our galaxy or the nearby galaxies. We're talking about the scales that encompass millions and billions of galaxies. We're talking about not just millions of light years, but billions of light years away. Truly huge scales, enormous scales, almost unthinkable. But by measuring the positions of galaxies, millions and billions of galaxies, and creating a three-dimensional map of the universe in terms of galaxies, we would be able to detect the deviation from Einstein's theory, or we would confirm that dark energy is, is the cause for acceleration. So that is the idea. And why haven't we done it yet? Well, we do not yet have such large maps of the universe. We have maps which are currently too small. We can apply the tests, but the errors are so large that they're not really conclusive. And why radio telescopes? Well, now I come in and say that it is radio telescopes that could deliver the biggest maps of the universe in terms of 3D maps of galaxies.
bigger than other, other telescopes. And I'll try to say something more about that now. So, slight change of gear now, we come to exploring the cosmos with radio telescopes. Point at the machine, not the screen, okay. Why radio telescopes? Well, there are a number of reasons. The, the one that's most relevant for me now is, is hydrogen. So hydrogen is the element of the 5% of normal matter that exists in the universe. Hydrogen is by far the dominant element, neutral hydrogen. It's essential for water, essential for life. We all know about it. But in terms of the universe out there, hydrogen is the pure atomic element that is most common. And you can't see hydrogen with a telescope. It's a gas. It doesn't shine. It can form stars which shine, but hydrogen itself doesn't shine, so you can't see it with normal telescopes. But it turns out that the innocuous hydrogen atom, which is a proton and an electron, can either have the spins of these two particles aligned or anti-aligned. And the anti-aligned state is slightly lower energy, so there's a preference for a spin flip to happen. And a very low energy photon, a 20 cent, one centimeter wavelength, is, is emitted, and that's a radio wave. And so if you've got a good enough radio telescope, you can, emit, you can detect the radio waves emitted by large enough collections of hydrogen. So if we look at a galaxy, for example, M83, this is the galaxy M83 in the optical, and you, what you're seeing is the shining stars. It's a spiral galaxy. The other galaxies are, are not part of it, but you can see the spiral galaxy, a bit like our Milky Way. And here's an image in the radio to the same scale where what you're seeing is the, the neutral hydrogen within and around that galaxy, much bigger, occupying a much bigger volume than the stars themselves. So this is what we see, or if you like here, with a radio telescope. You can't directly see it, so this image is created from the radio signal that is received by the telescope, by the dish. And we give it, give it a color so that we can interact with it visually. So we can see galaxies that contain hydrogen, like that one, and we can see them potentially, with a good enough telescope, very far out into the universe. We can create one of these gigantic maps if we have a good enough telescope because nearly all galaxies contain some, some neutral hydrogen. We can also go even further and more radical and more revolutionary. We can see massive enough clouds of hydrogen while they are busy giving birth to, to the first stars. So clouds of hydrogen inside galaxies give birth to stars continually. The new generation of stars is born amongst the dust of the dead stars but all the time it's the hydrogen gas which is at the center of the cycle. I'm now talking about something different. I'm talking about the early universe before there were any galaxies and in fact before there were stars, when there was just hydrogen. Optical telescopes can't tell us anything about that because they can't see these clouds of hydrogen. But the radio telescopes of the future, we're not there yet, it's, we're a long way off. Radio telescopes of the future will be able to map these massive clouds of hydrogen which are very, very slowly giving birth to the first generation of stars and ending the cosmic dark ages with the cosmic dawn. So this is one of the most amazing things that we hope to be doing in the 2020s, 2030s, real 2030s, 2040s. But I thought I'd show you it because it's so interesting. So the universe starts off with a big bang and then it's an extremely hot plasma for the first 400,000 years until it cools down enough. Why is it cooling? Because the universe is expanding. It cools down enough so that the electrons can find the protons, stick together and form hydrogen. Okay, so hydrogen then forms, but then the universe is completely dark. So the hot plasma and then the, the hydrogen clouds. This is the dark ages that last for about 100 million years. That's how long it takes for hydrogen to give birth to the first generation of stars. And in principle, future radio telescopes will be able to map this dark ages of the universe. It will be the most exciting thing in science that I can imagine, amongst many things. But it will take a long time. And when those stars are born, they light up the universe in what we call cosmic dawn. And from this moment, optical telescopes can kick in. They can start seeing these, this first generation of stars. 
So that question that you saw on the handwritten paper, can we, how can we see the first generation of stars? Well, with a radio telescope, we can see them before they were born. Um, but with current optical telescopes, we still wouldn't be able to see them. It'll take a while yet. So we'd be able to see the optical product of the birth and the, the process of birth with a tele radio telescope. What else can we do with the radio? Well, there are also not just radio waves from hydrogen, but radio waves emitted by charged particles that are being blasted out from massive black holes through their jets, and they generate radio waves. So radio telescopes are ideal for mapping supermassive black holes. We've got one at the center of our galaxy, and no, it's not dangerous unless you get really close to it. And we think that nearly all galaxies have these, uh, these supermassive black holes. And with a radio, a radio telescope, already we are able to map some of the properties of our own mass supermassive black hole. And in the future, we'll be able to map uh, much more, m many of these supermassive black holes far, far out in the universe. So there's a, an artist's impression of a supermassive black hole with its... Oops, I must have done something wrong there. Here are the jets of particles being blasted out from the central engine, the supermassive black hole, and this is the normal bits of the galaxy out there. We can also detect pulsars with, with radio telescopes. I mentioned pulsars, these extremely dense neutron stars that are spinning extremely rapidly, and they pumping out radio waves and other radiation, X-rays and gamma rays. And here should be a, an artist's impression of a pulsar. It's about the size of a city and it spins a few thousand times per second. You can imagine how dense it is because it weighs uh, as much as, as the sun, but it's the size of a city. And it's pumping out these radio waves like a light as it spins, it's like a beacon pumping out into the universe, which we can measure, and we can measure those radio waves with a radio telescope. And of course, you, you might say to me, why can't I use an optical telescope to detect pulses? Well, they're not shining in the optical. They're putting out radio waves, X-rays, gamma rays, not light, or not significant amounts of light. And then finally, I had to add in aliens, of course. Alien civilizations in our own galaxy, if they exist, they're likely to have radar and TV, and we should be able to pick that up with a sensitive enough telescope. And some organic molecules in exoplanets that might harbor life also emit radio waves. So radio telescopes can help for this in the search for extraterrestrial life. Okay, and there's a a picture of radio telescopes looking for extraterrestrial life. They actually have been doing this for a long time, but they're not yet sensitive enough. They haven't actually found any, any evidence yet. So now, finally, I get to the SKA, which, which is the giant radio telescope that, that I've been hinting at in my previous slides, exploring the cosmos with the SKA. So the SKA is the Square Kilometer Array. That name is intended to denote the total collecting area of this telescope once it's completed, one square kilometer, 100 football fields roughly. It will be the biggest ever radio telescope by far and the biggest ever, radio ex uh, biggest ever astronomy experiment built. It's kind of on the scale of the Large Hadron Collider. It just takes up more space and it's a different kind of instrument. And the good news is most of it is being built in South Africa, 70% of it roughly in South Africa, 30% in, in Australia. It is the biggest ever science experiment in Africa and the most historic opportunity that has ever emerged on the horizon for Africa because we're actually hosting it. It's actually being built here, mainly being built here. So in South Africa, we will have these big dishes. They're like DSTV dishes, but a lot bigger, 15 meters in diameter. There will be 200 of them in the first phase, and which will start operating around about 2025. Australia will have 130,000 of these kind of wire antennae called dope dipoles. They're much smaller, but there are many more of them. And these are the things that will go after the cosmic dawn and the, the dark ages, whereas the dishes will go after mapping the three-dimensional galaxy distribution 
detecting the pulsars, looking for the supermassive black holes, the things I've been talking about, both of those things. And in its final phase two, SKA, which will start about 2030, it will be 10 times bigger. And here's an artist's impression of how the dishes and the dipoles may be replaced by uh, these rather odd-looking objects here, which are being uh, designed in, in concept by engineers at the moment. So here's a map of Western Australian desert where the, the low-frequency dipoles are being set up. And here in the Karoo near Carnarvon, the, the dishes are, being, are going to be set up in an area of about 150 kilometers across. So in fact, that area has been declared an astronomical geographical advantage area. Development can't happen in this area without government permission. And it's pretty large. There's 120 kilometers of about that distance there. And it's near Carnarvon. Carnarvon is the, the, the main town near the site. And SKA Africa means that South Africa has partnered with eight other African countries, and they will come in at phase two of the SKA. So the dishes will be positioned in these eight African countries to form what's called very long baseline interferometry. And already a, a huge telecoms, a redundant telecoms dish in Ghana has been converted with the help of South African SKA engineers, has been converted into a radio telescope called Kutunzi and has, it's recently started doing science. It's a fantastic story of, for the development of science, not just in South Africa, but also in these other African countries. Now, the best news I've saved for this slide, I'm talking about the future, but in fact South Africa has already built the first 64 of those 200 dishes. These form the Meerkat Array, which is completed it's now operating, and it's just being tested, and it's going to start officially operating in July this year. It's the most amazing achievement. This will be by far the world's best radio telescope until it gets absorbed into SKA Phase 1 in 2025 or so. So South Africa will be not only hosting, but owning and controlling the world's best radio telescope until 2025. So we're getting very excited about that. We we astronomers, but it's also good news for South Africa as a whole and for Africa in general, for science, engineering, knowledge, whatever. Here are just a few photographs of the, from the air of the earlier stages of construction. This is the giant um, building where the dishes are assembled on site near Carnarvon giant cranes to put these, each dish in place. They have to have huge concrete foundations. They need to be really stable. And there's the control area with the underground. It goes a couple of floors underground where the computers, huge computers are, are stored, are operating to, to store all the data. So this has all been done. It's an absolutely fantastic success story. It's been done by local engineers and scientists, obviously collaborating with international engineers and science, but it has been a very much locally driven and, and locally conceived experiment. Here's, here's a picture of this midway through this when there were 32 dishes. The first light of the telescope, every telescope, radio or optical, has its first light when it takes its first image successfully. This happened in 2016. And it's, it, it created huge excitement amongst radio astronomers. I'm sure for people like yourselves, normal people, it, it doesn't look that exciting. It's a lot of dots. Okay, but each dot is a radio galaxy. Not only that, but this little area of sky that was being scanned, previously only 70 radio galaxies had been detected. Here are 1,300 already, when the telescope's only one quarter, even less than one quarter, of its capacity and it hasn't been fine-tuned or properly uh, ready, made ready for proper observations. So that was a huge bonus because you can build a massive array and you can do all the right things and you can turn it on and it may not work. And that, that does happen. It did work, so that was fantastic. And here's an image at the same, a year later, taken of another galaxy which 
in which the blue color represents stars in the center there, and the red is the hydrogen that has been mapped by Meerkat, showing you the true extent of this galaxy way beyond its shining part, the part that we see with optical telescopes. So let me come back to these three-dimensional maps of galaxies. Here's a computer simulation of what Meerkat will start to do, and then the SKA in phase one will do on a, a huge scale to create the biggest ever maps, three-dimensional maps of, of radio galaxies. And that computer simulation is what we hope to be achieving in the next decade or so. So with those maps, we will try to tackle this question of whether dark energy is real or whether Einstein's theory is actually breaking down. That's just my particular interest in specialization. I've mentioned some other science, but let me just list the other science apart from dark energy science. Some of the key science detecting more pulsars. That's a, a major science undertaking in its own right. Not that many pulsars are known, but the SKA will hope to detect hundreds and thousands of them. And once you have enough of them, you can actually use them as a gigantic galactic-sized detector of gravitational waves through a thing called pulsar timing. So there's a marvelous science whereby pulsars, once enough of them are detected, can also be used to then detect the gravitational waves that are passing through our galaxy. So that's very exciting science. Understanding radio galaxies, not just the supermassive black holes, but the galaxies themselves, that's major science for, for the SKA. I've already mentioned probing the dark ages and scanning the cosmic dawn and looking for extraterrestrial forms of life. And there are other science cases too, but those are maybe the major ones. I'll just to check how the time is going. How's the time going? Thumbs up? Okay, all right, great. Okay, so now I, I, I shift gear from the science geek getting all excited about everything to trying to be a bit more serious, all right? So science is great, but, there's always a but, the things that excite geeks. So what's the but here? What about poverty? Okay, because this experiment costs a lot of money. What about poverty? There we go. Meerkat cost more than two billion rand, and that's not the end of the story. We have to keep putting money into the SKA. It's an international collaboration. Shouldn't we rather be spending this money on housing or other social needs? Hang on, says the scientist and the humanist. I'm not just a scientist, I'm also a humanist. And the socialist, I'm also a socialist. Why victimize science? Why should science be victimized? Why should science be related to poverty? So let's interrogate this a bit. What about the banks and the mines and the super rich with their tax breaks who are pumping out billions upon billions of rands every month to offshore tax havens? Meerkat is small change. Why aren't you asking them about poverty, not you? The people who are saying, why, can we, how should, why should we spend this money on Meerkat? What about military spending? Complete waste of money. Absolute waste of money. And not just a little bit of money. Hundreds upon hundreds of billions of rands down the drain for nothing. Absolutely nothing. What about corruption by the Steinoffs and the Zuptas and everybody else who's got their nose in the trough? All of those things are far more to be called to account than science or art or music or poetry. We can have some music afterwards. We're not going to say, don't spend money on jazz because of poverty. We should ask the right people that question. Okay. Science doesn't cause poverty. Capitalism does. So don't ask science that question. Ask capitalism. Oh, that's good. South Africa and Africa need science, absolutely need science. We need art, we need music, we need literature, we also need science. Why do we need science? Why does Africa need more science? Well, I've listed a few things here, I think they're all pretty obvious, but maybe not 
It's essential for everyday life. Everything you do in everyday life, from your cell phone to your car to your food to everything, is underlain, is, is founded upon science. But more than that, it's to help us build a fair society for everybody. That's what science can help us do, actually. It's not, it's not magic, it's science that can do that. To help protect the environment, science has been abused in the cause of destroying the environment, only science can save the environment. To understand our origins and our place in the universe. You, uh, you, know, you can try spiritualism and, and magic, but science gives you something different. You can have that as well, but science really gives you a real understanding of that. And science, a science-based humanist and internationalist view, those things all to me go together, and they, they should be welded together as far as we can. Then the last one is just a sop to those who think about practical questions, more practical. Well, there's also the practical thing that we could move beyond just raw material exports. That's the kind of economy we've grown up with, to, to build us a, a more of a knowledge economy. What about some of the SKA spin-offs for, for getting now about should we spend money on it? What spin-offs does it actually bring, practically speaking? Well, first of all, world-class science will be done in Africa. And that, that, is, that is a major thing, that's a major achievement. It'll be a massive boost for science in general, not just astronomy, especially for big data. I haven't got time to go into this, but Meerkat and then the SKA are the biggest ever challenge for big data, and they're going to advance big data science more than anything else I know of. And that will benefit lots of other areas of society other outside of astronomy. And by doing these sorts of things, we'll raise the profile of science. We'll help to draw more of, our, of the youth, the next generation of youth, into science and engineering, and, and to become technicians as well, just as important. There obviously have been and there will be spin-offs for local industry and infrastructure that's already been happening. And this thing will go on for more than 50 years. It's an observatory, the SK. It's built to last for a long time. So my very last point, the last question, I was asked to pose some questions, so I'll move to the last one. Oops, sorry. It doesn't really help when I talk and inadvertently press the forward button. Sorry, there we are. Science belongs to humanity, so I'll just address this issue of science and decolonization a little bit, and throw out some ideas and see what you think. So science belongs to humanity, and it probably, almost definitely, but let me say probably, started in Southern Africa. Here's a nice little example of the first known example that I know of, of abstract thought in the Blombos Cave, in the, from the ancient hunter-gatherers, that famous cave in the Western Cape. Hunter-gatherers who originated in Africa, because that's where humans originated, they wondered at the night sky, like all humans ever have, except us city dwellers who only get an occasional chance to interact with the real night sky. This is the foundation of astronomy and science, the wondering at the sky by humans. That, that is the foundation of astronomy and science. And 200,000 years later, we're still doing it, but with just more sophistication. And that science doesn't belong to any country or any kind of human belongs to all humans. It originated with all humans. So what's the relationship of the SKA to the decolonization issue today, 200,000 years after what I'm talking about? Well, the colonial model of science is something like the following. You send your scientists and engineers to some third world country like Chile, let's not say South Africa, to build a telescope, and then you take the data from the telescope and you do the new science with it. That's the colonial model of science. The SKA Africa model of science is different. You train local engineers and scientists to help build this telescope. You have to get some help from outside, but everybody gets help, even the richest countries. And you train local scientists, especially from a new generation of scientists, to do new science with the data. That's what we're doing in the SKA project. And that, to me, is the decolonization, decolonization of science in regard to the SKA. He has an example of the kinds of things the SKA project's doing, try bringing school kids into contact with the SKA itself. 
then funding school kids to go to university. And I've got time to go through this graph, but it just shows the, the fraction of bursaries to previously disadvantaged groups versus previously advantaged groups. SK has had a huge impact in transforming the science community through bursary programs. And the communities around the SK site itself have been the target of, of the focus of SKA development efforts, from the training of artisans to the funding of the first ever students to go from that tiny town to university um, with bursaries from the SKA. I don't know what happened there. Oh, sorry, that was my end slide. I'll leave you with that slide. <laughs> Brief history of the universe. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, thanks a lot, Roy. Uh, we have time for a few questions, so uh, if you'd like to ask anything. Yep, there's a question. question. Oh, okay. um, hi, um, firstly, amazing presentation and so beautiful as well, the ideas. And for me, Thank just you. the thing with science for me is that you, you see it through facts and figures and even though it's beautiful concepts, mm it can sometimes feel really impersonal. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask, what do you think your role in stor of storytelling could be in the future of science? Yeah. Because I'm really glad you mentioned the hunter-gatherers because you know, it was the beginning of astronomy and science, but they wandered at the universe through storytelling. Mm. And I was wondering that maybe they could, you know, especially at university, we seem to be separating the sciences and humanities. And I'm thinking maybe the way for m more people to engage is to sort of move away from just the facts and figures and try to make it a more human approach. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. No, you make perfect sense to me. I completely agree with you. In fact, it's, it's a bit of a misconception that science is facts and figures. It, it relies on facts and figures in the same way that literature relies on the alphabet and spelling. But there's storytelling in literature has its equivalent in physics. We physicists, we have to construct a story of something we're trying to understand. It has to be a metaphor. We don't just do it, okay, this is the measurement, 10 to the minus 31, therefore, that's not physics. That's only the spelling and the alphabet of physics. We do create narratives, we do create metaphors, we rely on them. That's a, and I think there's a deep connection between physics and other sciences, literature, art, music. These things have been falsely separated. And there may be a reason, you know, there's this little socialist voice in the back of my head that says there might be a reason that the, the elite finds science as necessary to control because it's helpful for wars and other sorts of things. Whereas literature, art and these poetry is irrelevant. You know, let the people go and play their jazz. Maybe that's the historical reason why we have to separate them out. And really, there's also other issues that, you know, it's difficult to teach science in schools in a way that isn't just facts and figures and rules and recipes. It is hard. It's harder to do that than to teach other subjects because it's, it's like learning a new language. So there is a disadvantage for kids. And most kids get immunized early. Science, maths, what a nightmare, terrible. But actually, it's not like that. And it's, so there are many reasons why, but I completely agree with you. Here at the back. Hi, I'd just like to say thank you for the fantastic lecture and thank you from fellow socialists. Oh, thank uh, you. I'd, you can tell by the beard. <laughs> um, I'd also like to just ask uh, quick questions. One is why are the, uh, the uh, why is the SKA spread out? If you look at it on those pictures, even the artist rendering, there's a lot of space in between. Uh, that's probably a very quick question. The second one is, if you are looking at pulsar timing and you're looking for gravitational waves, 
Uh, isn't there a better experiment using lasers and we put them out in space rather than do it like LIGO did, uh, LIDO did on the ground? Do you have to do both? Is this just benefit? Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind comments. So for your questions, this, let me take the second one first. Uh, the reason is that LIGO and Virgo on, the ground in, on Earth can go after a certain wavelengths. LISA, the one in space you're talking about, can go after different wavelengths, and the pulsar timing is something in between. And even if the pulsar timing was going to replicate one of those two, it's always good to have two different ways of measuring the same thing. But in this case, they're actually going at... So they're going after different wavelengths, which means that these waves are generated by different systems. So if it's a neutron star, neutron star in spiral, it'll be a different kind of gravitational wave from a black hole, black hole. And the one people are really interested in, the black hole neutron star, and then there's colliding supermassive black holes and so on. Okay, and the first question, more tricky. Uh, optical telescopes are very much different from radio telescopes. It's easier to focus optical light because the wavelength is much shorter. Now, radio waves have a long wavelength, and therefore they're more difficult to focus. And also, the second question, complication is that to create an image from the radio is not as simple as from the optical. Our eyes are in the optical because, this, because of the sun, because the sun's energy is mainly given out in that narrow optical band of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we are geared to actually understand the optical, and an optical telescope is just naturally suited to. For radio, the radio waves are not suited to our visual imaging of, of things. To create an image is much more complex, and you need to put together different telescopes. The more detail you need, the wider apart they have to be. So for the, the very long baseline, it's called interferometry. So if you want to really get detail, if you want to go into the core of a, of a, of a supermassive black hole of an active galactic nuclei, quite far away, then you have to have thousands of kilometers so that you can point your two dishes, if you like, to a smaller and smaller area. So the more detail you want, the further apart they have to be. Okay. So I'm just wondering when you say they have to be further and further apart, why aren't they, say, in South America, Australia, South Africa, so that would be the ultimate mm -hmm. triangle to focus? Right. So the, 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 the site of the SKA was the subject of a many years long uh, competition that was held by the SKA International Collaboration. Uh, South America is not good for radio astronomy, except for the Andes, probably. So what you need for radio astronomy is it's different from optical telescopes. Optical telescopes you have to be far away from light pollution and you have to be in an area where the air is dry. Now for radio telescopes you don't need the dry air, and you need to be away from cities not because of the light pollution, but because of cell phones, television, and, and vehicle engines which generate radio waves through the combustion engine, and also aeroplanes. So you have to be away from things that generate radio waves, and you, that means you have to go where there are no people. So the Andes obviously is great, but then you also need power. You need a lot of power, because when you're connecting all these dishes together, you're just multiplying by many powers the amount of computing you need to process that data. And these gigantic computers need a lot of power. So getting power up to the top of the Andes, in fact, in Western Australia, they're having a big problem. They have to, they've got their own power station, that's not really good enough. Whereas in Carnarvon, the power is coming off the grid. That was one of the reasons why South Africa won the majority of the bid, because it had the infrastructure. So very few humans, but power is what you need for radio telescopes. Do you have a question? Yeah? There's another one. I have a quick question about the orbit of Mars. Is it, is it unique? Is it an anomaly? Oh, of, of Mercury. Oh, was it Mercury? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It was an anomaly from the point of view of, of Newtonian gravity, which had ruled the solar system for hundreds of years. It's a very successful theory Newton developed in the 17th century. And it almost perfectly describes the solar system, all the planets. But the planet that's closest to the star feels the strongest gravitational field, and so it's it's more likely to show up any disagreements between Newton's theory and reality. And there was this anomaly relative to New Newtonian prediction. And then Einstein, one of the first things he did when he published his theory was to show that the anomaly wasn't an anomaly, it was predicted by his theory to behave exactly like that. So in physics, so this comes back to the first question about facts and figures. In physics we know that our theories are are not permanent. Theories, are, they, they get developed and they work for a while and then experiment pushes them beyond their boundaries and then they, they have to be replaced by a better theory. There's no ultimate truth and no absolute and, and that's a good example of it. In the 19th century many physicists would have thought Newton's theory was it, that was it, that was the truth. But now we understand better that the truth is never going to be ultimately found as the final answer. It's just, we just get better and better approximations. Einstein's theory definitely will be shown to be wrong, but maybe not with the dark energy, I don't know. But somewhere it will be shown to be wrong. Um, okay, so my question is about like sort of extraterrestrial life. Right. And like if the galaxy is expanding, the galaxy is expanding and there are so many other galaxies that could like, I mean the mm. likelihood of there being more galaxies that can support life like say what Earth does and if also the variability of you know the, how progressive those societies are in mm. these different Earths mm. then surely there should be some societies that are more progressive you know technologically than Earth if we are trying to find them I mean surely there's some, there should be some that are so technologically advanced that they should have found us already um, I know, I mean, like that, the theory that I'm putting to you, yeah. you know the name for it, it's the Fermi Paradox. But yes. like, I just want to get uh, um, like your take on it. Okay. So I'm not an expert on the search for extraterrestrial life. But you're, you're quite right what you were saying. One thing you said which is not quite right, the galaxy isn't actually expanding. So when a galaxy forms, its gravitational field becomes so strong that it decouples from the expanding universe. In other words, it's the field inside the galaxy overcomes the field in the universe at large, the average gravity. So dark energy pushes the, the galaxies apart, but inside the galaxies it has no effect, it's far too weak. The galaxy isn't expanding. But the reason we can only search for life in the galaxy is that, say, a radar from a galaxy 100 million light years away would be so weak by the time it reached us we would never be able to detect it. So the search for extraterrestrial life for the conceivable future, the next, I don't know how many, forever maybe, can only happen in our own galaxy. Light takes about 30,000 years to cross our galaxy. And so that's roughly, you know, it's comparable to the, the lifespan of humans. That's 100 to 200,000 years. But that's sort of order of magnitude. So if we were finding life at the other end of the galaxy, the signal would reach us 10, 20, 30,000 years after it was generated. So if there's radar from there, they did radar long before we did, or TV. Um, but luckily they'd be so far away they wouldn't be able to come and colonize us, because <laughs> take them a long time to get to us. But yes, it, the, the number of stars in our galaxy is, is uh, hundreds of billions and the number of planets is tens of billions so the likelihood of life in the galaxy is, is quite high and our galaxy is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that we can potentially see there are many more beyond us so it's almost axiomatic that there must be life all over the universe there's, there's no reason to believe that humans are special but it could be that the conditions on earth were very special but even so when you've got billions upon billions of examples, it's, it's inconceivable there aren't other life forms, but we just, it's, it's, it's not clear that we'll ever discover them or, or find them. So. I have a question. Ah, ah, yeah. My question is more um, social. 
Okay. So I, my previous question that I wanted to ask that was sort of answered was about why South Africa won the bid. Mm. And I wanted to understand further how we won that bid. You explained the geographical conditions that okay. made it um, conducive for a, a project like this to happen here. Mm. But I'm wondering more about economically, how did we kind of rise to that occasion and what implications does that have for the socioeconomic kind of atmosphere in the country currently? Because I'm so with you that mm. science shouldn't suffer, but at the same time, how do we account for those funds? Where, I mean, where are those numbers? It's shocking to me that this is the first I'm hearing of this. Mm. So where is that money coming from? The two billion rand? Yeah. From the government? From, the, from DST, Department of Science and Technology. So DST, I don't know what its budget is, it's, it's quite a lot bigger. It will spend money investing in, in, in bioinformatics, you know, medicinal sciences and so on, and a little bit in astronomy, but this, we got, we got a big investment in astronomy. I think like many things, it was, it was fairly arbitrary. There was a particularly keen director general called Rob Adam in the Department of Science and Technology. And when the bid for the SKA was announced, he persuaded the minister that if South Africa won this bid, it would create the most tremendous opportunity to build a flagship science experiment that could be a beacon for promoting science in South Africa and Africa. And DST and the, the then president, I think it was Mbeki, agreed and supported it. So the answer is the ANC decided to do that. You could argue that they should rather have put the money into solar power or desalination plants or whatever. I wouldn't disagree with that, but that's just what happened. So. Um, yeah. You know, if we didn't have the military and we didn't have the super rich and the mines and the banks fun funneling out their profits, we could do all of those things and build houses. Maybe last question there. Cool, thanks so much for the awesome presentation. Um, my question is about the Big Bang Theory, and my understanding is that at the, that at the Big Bang, um, everything was sort of at a singularity, and then there was this process of expansion. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, uh, how is it that particles can be attracted to one another and not be uniformly gravitationally pulled against each other? How do they begin clumping up if... If, if sort of space and time are created at the same time, um, is there yeah. theories to, d to address that? Good. And that, that's the first part of the question. The mm -hmm. second part of the question is, it's theorized the universe is 13.8 billion years old or something like that. Um, what, how is that, how is it possible that things can be further than that in terms of billions of light years away from us if, if there's, uh, okay. yeah. So the first thing I'd say is that when I said earlier that Einstein's theory will definitely be shown to be wrong in some regime, the Big Bang is an example. So a singularity where the temperature is infinite is not physically possible. Nature will not, you know, you can't have a singularity. And that's a signal that Einstein's theory can't describe the beginning of the universe. So you have to ask the string theorists, there's one there, there's another one there, he's running away, there's a third one somewhere else. They're the people who are trying to develop a quantum uh, correction of Einstein's theory that could explain the Big Bang. But Einstein himself worked on that, people have been working on it for a long time, it's a very tough problem. So in some sense, we don't really have any answer to your question. But another thing just to point out that in the standard model of the universe, the Big Bang happens everywhere, not just at one point. So if we trace back the, the point where we are in our galaxy all the way back to the Big Bang, then the 
a galaxy a billion light years away does the same thing. We don't end up at the same point. We end up, this, the Big Bang happens everywhere. So you don't have this problem that, your, the last question, how can there be things further away? The things further away, they, the light from them hasn't yet reached us. So that's why we, can't, we haven't seen them and we can't see them until the future. But uh, you also asked a sophisticated question, how do particles clump together when they're expanding away? And, and the reason is there must have been some mechanism that introduced some fluctuations, some irregularities in the plasma. And that, that's what we usually talk about as called inflation. An epoch of inflation which, which helped to create those irregularities that then are the seeds for the formation of stars and galaxies. Good question.